The following podcast contains opinions from paid professionals. The information provided in this podcast is general in nature and is not advice. Gambling is not a financial strategy. For free and confidential support, call 1-800-858-858 or visit gamblinghelponline.org.au. Hello and welcome to episode three of Horse Racing 101, uh, the podcast designed to help recreational punters improve. I'm Paul Joyce, joined by the one and only Count Dickens. How are you? I am fantastic and very excited to be back in studio. Yes, we're looking forward to this one. We've done two episodes already. If you mm-hmm. haven't already watched them, make sure you do. They will set the foundation for what we're going to look at today. And uh, starting today, we're actually going to clean out the closet and we're going to just touch on a few things we may Who's not closet? have... Uh, <laughs> Probably your closet, I suppose, because it's probably messier than mine. Bad idea. So that's why we're going to clean out your closet. So (laughs) what we're going to do is just touch on a few things we didn't probably touch on in episodes one and two that we want to cover off. Mm. Uh, Again, all of this design just to help punters get a little bit better at what they do, a few tips and hints. Mm -hmm. And if you uh, adopt these, I think it will definitely help your overall punting experience and hopefully improve a little bit on what you're already doing. So that's the aim of what we're about to get into. So we're going to clean out the closet, Kian. And the first thing we're going to touch on here is sectional times because it's a Mm. term that's thrown around a lot. Some people swear by them. They live and die by them. Other people don't even use them at all. Uh, Sectional times, of course, uh, is what we're going to touch on. So first of all, I use them. Mm -hmm. Do you use them? And Mm -hmm. if you do, how do you use them? Okay, so I don't use them. um, It's not a rule of thumb thing with mine. I use them when I'm doing Saturday meetings. If I see a horse that I think is doing better work than others, I will then go to the sectional times to make sure that that backed up what I saw with the eye, opposed to it maybe being flattered by passing some horses that were ending on their runs. And the other thing I like to look look at is final 600s. And if a horse was well back in the ruck, how will it's done to make up the margin that it's done? Or a horse that's burnt the candle at the beginning of the race and been able to back it up at the end. But it's not something I live and die by, um, but something I do use. Yeah, for sure. I'm pretty much the same as you, actually. I look at the sectional times pretty much for every meeting when I go back through them, if you can get hold of them. Uh, Obviously, New South Wales, Punters Intel is a wonderful app that gives you every single bit of the sectionals you could possibly need. And in Queensland, on Racing Queensland, they do pretty much every track now uh, in Queensland, provincial, even some country tracks. So uh, you can get your hands on them very easily. And uh, as you said, I use them to back up what my eyes have already told me when I'm watching a replay. Uh, and sometimes you will catch something in the sectionals that the eye may have missed. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen here and there. You might see a horse with the fastest or second fastest closing splits that when you watch it the first time, you thought, oh, is that really right? And you go back yeah. and watch it again, and you're like, yeah, that did, did actually close off a lot better than I first thought. I think, too, if you don't want to get sucked into it too much, because it's definitely something you can, because it's what you're looking at uh, on paper with times, and you, can, you may think, well, you know, but it can be smoke and mirrors a little because that horse may have had the most economical economical run opposed to others. So it's just something I think you've got to take on face value, use it superficially, oh, I would say. That point you made is outstanding because it is the one thing that comes up time and time again. Yeah. A horse with a soft run back on the fence, cuts the corner, runs the best final splits of the race and... You know, punters can fall into that horse mm-hmm. next start. But as you said, if it had such an economical run, the horse three wide, four wide doing the work mm. that only ran 0.3 of a second slower yeah. for the last 600 was probably a better run. And, and made a run from the 800. That's you know, they, they can't make yeah. sustained runs out long. So, so yeah. a bit, bit like a lot of things we've discussed, it's important to look at, but mm-hmm. it's not the be all and end all in our opinion. And I think it's just something you have to add into the mix of yep. uh, doing your post race form. It's another tool in that toolbox. Oh, you got it in there. Well done. <laughs> All right, now we're going to discuss rail placement. This is something that uh, is, again, not the be-all and end-all for sure, but obviously mm-hmm. the rail can be in a true position. It can be up 2 metres, 3 metres, 6 metres, 8 metres, 9, 10, depending on what track you're betting on. And those rail placements do move uh, constantly these days, which is something back in the old days punters didn't have to worry about. But these days, rail placement is a thing. It can affect how a track plays. How important is it to you? It is all about knowing your tracks. So obviously we cover the a lot of the provincial meetings up here in Queensland and I think I've built enough a profile on each track that I know if the rail's out at say the Sunshine Coast it's it's not much of a worry. They've still got a lot of territory to work with and it's not a it's it doesn't have a camber, it's obviously got a crown, so you're getting closer to that drier part of the track. 
um, but then you get a tight turning, more tight turning circuit track such as Ipswich. It's a lot more important in terms of where you're drawn um, and obviously the field sizes are limited more too. So um, just knowing your tracks, Eagle Farm, not so much, doesn't really worry me at all. Um, but then Doombin, it's a little bit different too on the flip side. 100%, couldn't agree more. I think coming from Sydney with my background down there, uh, you know, Rose Hill when the rail starts to edge out further and further, uh, especially when the track's good to, to, to riding fairly fast, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you really do want those on-pace fence runners. Mm -hmm. um, there's no question about that. Randwick, probably not so much, a bit similar to Eagle Farm. Uh, and Sunshine Coast, there's such a big open space there that it's rare that the rail placement will have an effect. But at Canterbury, it will have an effect. As again, if the rail goes out at Canterbury and the track's riding quite firm and fast, uh, it's going to be very hard to come around them and make ground. So, I mean, it's logical. And I know a lot of punters keep stats on it all. Uh, and, and the track played this way on this particular day, this one, that particular day. Again, for yeah. me, I'd like to take it day by day. Me too. Uh, you know, you've got, you've got different... And we walk a lot of tracks, yeah. right? So yeah. when you walk a track, the profile changes from week to week. 100%. Um, so, so it's hard to line something up from four months ago uh, and then compare that to a the same track but it's a totally different profile four months later a lot in the middle of winter compared to the peak of spring uh two track the same track can be very different exactly it, it, it's grass coverage it's it's the irrigation or rainfall it is how long the grass has been left or how short it's been cut so it's another gray area and another thing to not buy too much into i think in terms of um thinking that again it's the be all and end all well done all right let's move on now to wet tracks we did just touch on track condition Obviously, wet tracks is a thing that does thwart punters at times. We can get it some what? wet thwart. Thwart. <laughs> thwart. It means that uh, it means thwart? it gets in their way a little bit uh, ah. because obviously we can have wet winters yep. where you might get th Sydney's had plenty of them. You might get yep. three three months of heavy tracks, yeah. uh, and you just can't get away from them. And it's hard to assess horses' form when they haven't raced much on wet tracks. Mm -hmm. I mean, up in Queensland, I think the last twelve to sixteen months we've been lucky to have. Yeah. three or four wet tracks, like genuine wet tracks. So mm -hmm. we've had a, we've been lucky that we can just constantly do our form for good tracks. But when you do get a, a run of wet tracks or an unusual wet track out of nowhere, how does it affect you doing the form? Mm, well, I'll go back to what I can see on paper in terms of their, their stats. But some horses, you can't necessarily uh, brush them with the brush that, that a, either A, they don't handle the wet tracks uh, because you just don't have the data. They haven't run on enough wet tracks to say that no they don't handle it when they did run on that wet track were they fit were they ready to win things like that so it's building profiles on the horses themselves we're, we're lucky to do that up here in queensland um it comes down to horses feet their action so many different things um again you're more seasoned horses at a well race you can really build data on whether they're genuine wet trackers but they also have to have fitness on their side so it's tricky. It makes it a lot more tricky, um, I think, when doing the form for wet tracks and how genuinely wet is that track too. And I think that's the beauty of getting to the races and for us as well, which other punters can't. But that's, a, again, the beauty of our coverage. We can go and walk the track. Exactly right. And look, I think, again, I agree with what you say. I think when you, when you, we're going to get into rating shortly uh, and obviously there's a section there for, for going and you can add or subtract uh, a certain amount of points for various horses if they've got if you've proven they're not a wet tracker, mm -hmm. but they're running on a wet track, you can take a bit off them. If they love a wet track, but they've been running on dry tracks for a long time, obviously you can increase their rating because mm -hmm. they, they should improve getting back onto a wet track for the first time. The other thing, of course, which you touched on is that all horses are different. And I've seen horses that their first 20 starts didn't like a wet track at all. Yeah. By the time they're six and seven, yeah. they start to perform better on wet tracks. Mm. So you, and I think you can't too, lock and load too early. I think you've got to be willing to uh, adapt at all times. Pivot, there. always pivot with horses. And I know... A false favourite, what I would consider a false favourite or a horse that is, is unders in the market is a horse I know racing on a good surface. I've actually, I've seen the horse in the flesh. I know they've got a flatter foot. I know they don't have as much heel. So them on a good four or good three surface, top, top in bedding or something like that, I can pick holes in that. But then when I can wait for them to get onto a softer surface, well, that's when it's, you're ready to back them. Yeah, well, that's a good point. We just touched on wet tracks. Obviously, good tracks has also got the, your little intricacies that you need to have a look at. Obviously, some horses handle firmish tracks a yeah. lot better than others as well. So track condition, something all punters should have a good look at. Mm -hmm. All right, next of all, we're going to move on to where do you bet? Obviously, we both like a little punt. And uh, obviously, where do you bet? How do you bet? And uh, how I do bet you... with Tab, Joycey. Of course, we both bet with Tab. <laughs> that's the obvious answer. But... Uh, 
Like, wh- how do you approach a meeting as far as uh, when do you like to get your money on? Do you like to get it on? You've done your form before the market's coming out. You want to jump on that top price, or do you want to wait until the last thirty seconds to get all that information in front of you? Oh, hands down, do the form. Obviously, pick your first four before markets are out. But if you've just got a dead set standout top selection, I am re- refreshing the app, waiting for markets to open because that's when I want to bet on a single and just bet on that horse in particular. Obviously, sometimes it changes. You you, you happen to take unders, which I seem to do all the time. <laughs> um, so, but that that's my usual um, route is, is I'll, if I've got one that I just dead set thinks the best bet of the meeting, I'll sit and wait for markets to open and have that single bet. Jump in early. To think that it's going to firm. Yep, well, I think that's the way you've got to approach it, especially yeah. the, with the roles we have, doing the form early and, and making our decisions uh, yeah. and then waiting for those markets. And if we think it's value, you can't resist but jump in and take it early. Yeah. Uh, the other option, of course, and I've heard a lot of uh, very good punters talk about this, is waiting until the absolute last minute to get your money on uh, because by that stage you have access to every piece of information you can p- possibly ask for, which includes what we just touched on, track conditions, weather, uh, last-minute fluctuations in the market, mm-hmm. things that change on a day that you didn't expect when you did the form 36 hours before the races. So, again, a lot of different ways to look at it and approach it. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm on the same path as you. I like to get on early mm-hmm. and try and snap up that value when the tab first posts their markets. And, uh, yeah, I'll do it through the tab app. With your exotics too, quadrillas, I will do the race before the quaddy. And it's just what you've alluded to. You've got the data, how the track's playing, um, th- certain things like that. Track surface, is it, is it a genuine soft, sen- genuine good? Because there might be some horses that you could possibly add in for a bit of value and things like that. I think that's great advice, uh, putting your quaddies on as late as possible yeah. uh, is certainly something that I like to do as well. All right, now where do we get our access, so where do we access our information from, Kian? Obviously, we do spend a lot of time doing form. We discussed it on episodes one and two, mm-hmm. and uh, we do spend a lot of time in the office pumping away at the form, replays, looking at our form guides, etc. What sort of sites do you use? What sort of sites do you recommend for punters to jump on and have a look at? I think Riser, obviously, for your fields and your, your most updated scratchings and things like that. Um, Riser for your gear changes, so I've got another tab open for that. Uh, then we're going to Racing Queensland for replays, Racing New South Wales for your Southerners replays. Um, and then I look at RaceNet, and that is essentially to see the number of winners that have come out of subsequent races and, and then be able to find those winners and, and see if it holds up ratings-wise. 100%. I think that's something I taught you, wasn't it? I think it was. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, you've learnt one thing out of me in the last two years, which is great. And look, I pretty much use all those sites as well. I think Racing Queensland, Rise, uh, uh, Racing New South Wales is a fantastic site to do mm, your replays from. And of course, you've got your tab app as well. If you're out and about and you don't have hold of a computer, your tab app will often have most of those replays on there as well. Uh, if you want to use your phone or your tablet, you can still do your replays off the tab app. So that's a good little... Uh, hint if you are out and about and you still want to have a look at your replays doing your form all right tricks of the trade kian we're going to get stuck into this now with you uh this is just any little edge that you're willing to share i know you've got a few little uh how would i call them just just little ideas methods methods ideas processes that pop up into your head from time to time and Mm -hmm. you're like i always like to do this i always like to do that and most of the time it's pretty close to the mark so Mm -hmm. uh just Share a few of those with us if you want to. I guess in Queensland, um, which is, is is my backyard, and uh, so I, I probably pigeon my pigeonhole myself to Queensland racing too because I'm just so invested in it. So you get to know your trainers, I guess their processes with horses. A trainer like David Van Dyke is is near unbeatable when he freshens up his horses uh, off what may have been a, a under par run prior. Uh, Tony Gollan when he gets horses from down south. He sets them up on a blank canvas. He takes all the gear off them, and um, genuinely, gen, 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 gender, gen, genuinely, gen, generally, 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 no. generally, 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 yeah. generally, uh, you see an improved run. Um, first up. First up. For sure. For sure, yeah. Um, and obviously, we touched on choke downs and things like that. Okay. Is where is where I like to hone in. Now, another area that I've noticed with you, uh, which you've de- you're definitely a lot better at me than this, miles better at me than this, is your eye for a horse in the yard. Golf. <laughs> There's only one thing you're better at than me, and this is it, all right? I'm not, I'm not giving you any more, so you better enjoy this one. But it's your eye for a horse in the yard. Obviously, you've spent your whole life around horses, your adult life at least. Yeah. Um, and uh, even though I have since I was a kid going to the races, um, I've never been as hands-on with horses as you have. So you've definitely got a knack. Uh, I've seen you at the races before when you haven't done the form and you've just had to basically turn up and do your best out of the yard and you've still managed to walk home with a couple of double-figure winners. So 
What do you look for in a nutshell when you're trying to find horses out of the yard? I still am working on thinking what's my sort of black and white go-to when looking for a horse in the yard because it is different. I've always said if you go to the races, look at the shiniest, healthiest, healthiest horse uh, that's stepping out nicely, overstepping and things like that, it just does not guarantee you a winner. It just does not mean that's the best horse on the day. Um, it's just building a profile on horses you know, getting that data on a horse you see in and out, uh, particularly from their first ever preparation, seeing how much they've grown in their break because if they've been able to grow and mature, you know that their mark's not reached yet, they might go on to a lot better things. So it's, 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 for me, it's building the profile, forecasting when they're going to peak. Um, I like to go down after the race and you can have a look how much they've blown up over the back. You can listen to them and see that recovery too because that gives you an indication of how fit they were or how much fitness is to come. So it's a number of things that, that go into it and it's something I'm still – I'm happy to pivot on every time because every horse is different. So I don't think there's a, a black and white answer for it, but it's a number of things that I use when looking at them in the yard. Yeah, but you're certainly very good at it and it's the only thing – you're better than me at. Uh, I'd probably ride a horse better than you're you. You're definitely not better at me at golf. <laughs> I've never seen you play golf, but you, I'm not very good at golf, but I'm still better than oh, you. Oh, I golf. can hit a golf ball. I don't know about that. <laughs> um, I think you'd be good after the golf game when you get to the clubhouse, but during the golf game. The 19th uh, hole. Maybe not so much. <laughs> All right, Karen, that's cleaned out the closet. I think we've covered off most things we want to cover there. Most punters that are asking questions, they're the, bullet there. they're the sort of questions they wanted to find out. So thank you very much for helping us out with that. All right, now you're going to start to probably probe me a little bit more as we get into actual ratings. Now, yeah. we're getting into the nuts and bolts of things here in episodes three and four. Mm -hmm. We did tell punters from the very first episode we were going to attempt to help them assess their own markets. So from a field of runners, we want to get all the way to use assessing your own set of prices, and then you can use those prices to determine where the value sits in the market. So it's like the granddaddy of all things you can try and attempt to do as a punter, and we're going to try and attempt to do that on this podcast. So we're going to start off with ratings because that is the foundation of uh, assessing your own markets. So um, we're going to get into it now, and look, you can just ask questions as they arise, but basically what we're going to start off with is is what are ratings, yes. right? And it's just a numerical number which scores a horse's performance. That's the easiest way I can describe it. So if a horse runs in an Ipswich Maiden or a Randwick Group 2, it's going to get a figure, and that figure is basically the horse's score from that run. And over time, you're going to build up those scores every time a horse goes to the races, and you're going to be able to line them up and see if a horse is improving, if he's getting worse with racing, if he's just flatlining across every single time he goes out, he runs the same score. Uh, and that will help you line up, obviously, horses when they compete against each other that might have run at Randwick or might have run at Doombin or might have run in Melbourne, and then they start meeting in the same race, well, how do you line that form up? Well, yeah. the easiest way to do it is to use their rating, which mm -hmm. is just a simple number that scored their performance. If one horse scores higher than the other, that horse should beat the other horse. I mean, it's pretty simple, right? Makes well, sense. in theory. In theory, exactly. Yeah. It's a lot more complicated when you get into it, but that is the theory. Yeah, and that that's is, the gist. And that is why ratings are so important to I use. I think they're great too. And, and they're so accessible too. So if you don't have time to do them yourself, which not many punters do, you can get them from anywhere. Uh, and that's Where do what, you get them? And that's probably what we're going to talk about. I mean, you can get them from Racing Australia. Mm -hmm. They do their own. Each state does their own. Racing mm -hmm. Queensland, Racing New South Wales, I'm sure Victoria do their own. I'm sure every state does their own. Uh, and then you've got, you've got companies that you can buy them off as well. Uh, you've got professional outfits that keep even more extensive data, more extensive ratings, whether they're time ratings, weight ratings, whatever you want to do, and you can purchase them as well. But uh, personally... Uh, if I had the time, I'd do everywhere. But uh, with the time I've got, I concentrate on just keeping my own uh, in Queensland. So, in terms of determining value, in determining value, so that is the key. So we're going to get to that as far as a rate. What what you do with a rating to use it to turn it into a price. Mm -hmm will then be able to indicate to us where the value sits in the market. So we're going to get to that in episode four, but we really just wanted to cover off what a rating is. And I'll just give you a quick example, right? So out of all the years I've been keeping ratings, the highest horse that's ever, she, she actually blew my rating scale to a new level because I, I thought I'd gone as high as I could go. Hmm. Black Caviar held the top rating on my figures, a, a, a figure of 83. Now, a figure of 83 doesn't mean much to anyone, mm -hmm. but that was my highest figure at the time, right? right? So no horse had rated higher than 83. That was Black Caviar. Winx came along. And in the end, I thought, well, there's nowhere else to go. I can't keep giving her an 83. Like, she's better and better than that. So if she ended up hitting an 84. So she's been the highest horse I've ever rated. Obviously, you can look at time form ratings. I think off the top of my head, she might have been around the 100 and 
thirty something mark, like, and that was also extremely high, if not yeah. the highest a horse for Australia. Um, Black Caviar was probably right on her heels as well. So they're pretty obvious ones, but they're, they top most rating charts in Australia over the last fifteen or twenty years. The other thing we're going to show, we're going to put a table up because mm -hmm. there's a little bit of maths coming in episode four. Don't worry, yeah. don't worry. It's 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 primary <laughs> school maths. Smoke over for it's going to be pretty. It's going to be something you can handle. <laughs> uh, we're just going to put a table up, which just convert, converts rating figures into markets and, and gives you a percentage chance of winning as an assessed price. And we we touched on this right in episode one with our coin mm -hmm. uh, when I flipped you a coin and there are only two options, heads or tails, and it was 50-50, which meant heads is a two dollar chance. Tails is a $2 chance. We're going to get into that now with horses, so it's a lot more complex, but the theory is the same. We're just trying to work out what percentage each horse chance have a winning, mm -hmm. and we're going to convert that percentage to a price. And yep. then you're going to be able to look Find at Find your value. You're going to be look at that price against the market, and you're going to be able to see your value. So yeah. when we get to that stage, it'll make a lot more sense, but uh, that's what we're up to with ratings. Hopefully that covers it off well enough. Uh, obviously, you can go a lot deeper with ratings, but they're the basics, uh, the nuts and bolts of how they work, and then something punters shouldn't be scared of. You know, there's something that punters can look at. We're going to talk to uh, one of the ex-handicappers in a minute, aren't we, Mitch, Mitch Trelevin, and he's going to give us his idea of, of sort of when he was working in the handicapping department, how ratings worked, and even what he says I think will make things a lot clearer. So you had a chat to Mitch, and we're going to have a look at that shortly. Yeah, he's a, he's a really switched-on guy too, and he's now working as Tony Gollum's racing manager. So um, without knowing it as, as common knowledge, I assume he... He's pretty crucial in helping best place horses um, to not necessarily beat the handicapper, but, but be well weighted. Weighted. All right. Well, you did have a chat to Mitch, so let's have a listen to that now. Yeah, the, the jobs um, covers a lot of ground, but mainly um, coming up with the race fields and uh, to do that with, with handicapping, we've obviously got the template and the ratings based system now. So um, you know, each each horse when they win a race uh, get a rating and um, re-rating those horses after each run is is a really important part of the job and um, yeah that's that's where most of the time goes. So for those who don't know what are handicap ratings and where do punters go to find them? Yeah ho all horses ratings are normally displayed on Racing Australia after their their run so um, Racing Queensland's got a, a, a pretty good handicapping template or, or and policies and procedures that are, that are on their website and um, yeah, punters can, can go there and, and get a lot of really good information there. So how do those ratings relate to the weight given to a horse in a race? It depends on the race, um, you know benchmark races are, are probably the normal um, <laughs> explanation for that and, and the highest rated horses get the most weight so benchmark 80s um, an 80 rated horse will get 60 kilos now. We've, we've recently changed it in Queensland. So top weight gets 60 and then they're weighted down from there depending on their rating. So um, benchmark races are, are really well utilised in Queensland for, for horses that have found their mark. But um, yeah, they're, they're, they're good betting races as well. So is there a way that punters can use this system to their advantage and what should they look for? I think um, of, of late, you know, the last five, 10 years in Queensland, we've really started to utilise class set weight racing. Um, more so in town on, on Saturdays, you'll see very frequently, you'll see class three plates and class six plates. And um, essentially what that means is you, you're weighted off how many races you've won, um, which is your class. And um, yeah, you can, you can have horses that are significantly higher in the ratings carrying the same weight as, as horses that are, are, are very low in the ratings. So you can really sort of identify which horses can win and which horses can't. Okay, Kian, it's time for Changing Gears, one of our favourite segments on the show where we discuss an important gear change. Mm -hmm. We had you out and about doing some uh, research, some quality interviewing, and you caught up with Sheldon, the uh, farrier for the Tony Gollan stable, and you asked him about the effect of concussion plates. Fact or fiction? Punish shouldn't place a bet on a horse when they see concussion plates in the gear change. Fiction, yeah. No trouble at all there. Um, just all it is is helping the horse cop a little bit of concussion on, on a hard ground. So yeah, go, with, go for gold. So there it is. And I agree with Sheldon um, for obvious reasons because he's a subject matter expert, but um, I wouldn't be deterred too much by the gear change of um, concussion plates. It's, it's, it's obviously a little, it's like a little padding in, in the um, brace plate itself, of course, to absorb that little bit extra concussion. And, and mainly you'll see it go on when we know we're gonna get a good track. Um, so, so trainers will forecast if we're going to be on really on top of the ground and they may add the, add the concussion plates and they're similar weight to race plates. So for mine, I'm never too deterred unless that uh, horse has been running quite under par on good tracks prior. 
time for, no doubt, everyone's favourite segment of the entire <laughs> podcast count. Uh, and it is, of course, you language, reckon? because uh, <laughs> racing has its own language, mm. and you certainly have your own language and your own words that you like to throw around and use quite often, and we call this uh, the Keanism. For a horse, deb- debutuing. <laughs> At least tongue... <laughs> I need a tongue tie. <laughs> <laughs> this is a new one that's really just come into your, into your lingo probably in the last few months, but it, it's constantly out there. And uh, we're, of course, we're talking about what is a weird flex? Uh, weird flex is when somebody is essentially in a roundabout way self promoting themselves or something, and you can really bring them da- back down to earth or the people who are listening by just sort of throwing it out there and being like, hmm, weird flex, you know, like weird flex. And everyone will instantly realise that. That um, person has been big noting themselves. Exactly. Right. So that's when the weird <laughs> flex comes out. It's, it's you just basically pulling them back to earth with, with a weird flex. It's, an, it's a simple yeah. term, but yeah. it pulls them back and lets everyone else know that, hey, old mate over there was just pumping up his own tyres. Exactly. Right. So we've got to the bottom of weird flex. Now, how about this for a racing term? Because this is one that you've got to wind the clock a long way back and I'm sure punters understand what it means. You hear it all the time. Yeah. But have you ever actually thought about it? Like, we're talking about the word furlong. Mm. I mean, we say it all the time. They're yes. at the furlong pole. There's a furlong to go. They ran the fastest final furlong of the race. What is a furlong? It's 200 metres. And where did it come from? I have no idea, but <laughs> it probably should, but it doesn't matter because I know what it means. I don't know the origin of it. But as a track work rider, yes. um, Furlong, I spoke, we spoke, well, obviously we still speak in furlongs, uh, but that 200 metres, so there's something you dealt with every day, um, you know, five home two and things like that. So That's right. Yeah, you, you know, you're going out to do your work over a certain amount of furlongs. So That's it's, right. So it's, very, it's very old school, but it's very relevant still. We don't say 200 metres. Well, this is what I'm getting to. Should we start saying 200 metres or should we keep no, no, no. the term furlong? do not fix what's not broken. Well, okay, so just just to touch on furlong then, because it's it's not used anywhere but racing. No one else uses a furlong, right? Mm-hmm. You don't have car racing using furlongs. You don't have sprinters using furlongs. You don't know no furlong races in the in the Olympics. Yeah, they're over two hundred meters, right? I didn't actually think I'll have to ask Siri that. So I'll give you where furlong basically originated from. Or it's actually two hundred and one meters is a furlong, oh. and it originated from something along the lines of, and this isn't one hundred percent accurate, so just bear with me. It, it's like when they used to plough a field with an ox. That's how far back we're going. We're going 400 Jeez. years ago. Wow. An ox could only pull a plough so far. Yeah. And they said, well, that's a furlong. Yeah. So he has basically ploughed that field for 201 metres. So that's as far as a furlong should be. And we're still using that term now in 2023. But we're only using it in horse racing. Weird flex. And obviously, <laughs> the Americans use it a lot. The furlong pole, like they say it all the time. Right? We use it talking amongst ourselves and track yeah, work and yeah. who ran the fastest furlong. We use a mile a lot too. We use a mile a 1600 lot. 1,600 metres. The round mile. Yeah. You know, but, but obviously a mile is still used a lot Half in, a in, mile, the, in the US as well. 800 metres as opposed to saying 800 metres. That's right. So they're terms that are used. Oh, I love them. I yeah. think it's part of racing language. I don't want to change it. I certainly don't want to be the devil's advocate and say, let's start calling everything metric because uh, it's our own little piece of history and I love it. And I think the Americans love it. I'm not sure if they use furlong a lot in England and... In Europe, I'm not sure. I assume they do. I'm going to but, do some um, heavy research. That's with the that's, back of that's this. the that's the Keanism into the furlong talk for this episode. So hopefully you got something out of it. You know how I love those little bits of trivia. I know you can't stand them, but you no, know, I, it's I like to get them out. The there. ox and yeah, the cart and plowing. <laughs> and... <laughs> anyway, it's out there now. All right, so now we're going to get on to something a little bit different. I d- the one meter. Where does why? Why is Furlong 201? I think yeah. that's, when the, that's when the ox got tired, right? <laughs> he just said, I've done 201, I'm not doing 202. Yeah. That's just an ox for you. It doesn't sit well with me. You know, I'm very OCD. And then it you, doesn't sit oof. well, does it? No, it that makes extra me meters, squirm. That extra meter is really going to yeah. get into your head. I'm going to forget you even said it. Yeah, well, you, you forget most <laughs> things I say, so you'll, that one will go down just with the rest of the others. We're going to discuss Let's Get Topical. That's mm-hmm. another segment we've had on each of our shows, and we just talk about something totally different every week and this week is really different and, and for some punters it might be a little bit eyes, eyes glaze over uh, because we're talking about the modern punting landscape and what it looks like mm-hmm. and what it looks like right now as far as serious professional semi-professional punters go is mathematical models it's machine learning it's algorithms it's punching data into a computer and spitting out a set of prices and betting off those prices compared to the market obviously 
that's how they believe it works best and I'm certainly not going to say it doesn't work. Uh, and I've worked very closely with a lot of people working on these models to try and get the most efficient, effective model they can possibly get. Mm -hmm. uh, and particularly with machine learning, which is a massive new thing on the scene. Our kids are coming out of uni with these degrees in machine learning and it's getting very close to AI as well, which is where this is all probably headed, artificial intelligence. Just so the term machine learning, mm. is that is that an overall about all this, all g gathering data? It's it's almost, the, so an algorithm is basically when, when punters have got their own data, put it into a mathematical equation that spits out a spits price out. for a horse, right? Yeah. Machine learning is a little bit different to that. Machine learning is more like you just throw the data into a into a funnel. And that data sifts through this funnel, you spin around a thousand times and it spits out your answer right at the bottom. So you don't even really know what data that machine is, is using more than another part. So with an algorithm, you might say, I want to put most percentage onto my weights, a little bit of percentage onto the jockey, a bit of percentage onto the horse's ratings. With machine learning, you just throw everything into this funnel and it'll spin it around. It'll pick the bits it thinks is the most important and it'll just run patterns and patterns and patterns thousands and thousands of times and it'll spit out down the bottom, I think this horse should be $1.50. And that's how machine learning sort of headed. And AI is probably headed in the same direction. I'm not on top of AI at all. But uh, machine learning, I did a lot with trying to help uh, a lot smarter people than myself come up with a program or model you to say that? that worked. <laughs> you did you say that. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you know what? They, they find it really hard to find that golden nugget. They find it hard to get over the line. You know why? I know plenty of reasons why, and we're about to discuss them, which is why we brought this up today. And, and the funny thing is, it's, it's in the name. Machine, machine. Horses are not machines. They are not machines. Jockeys are not machines. Exactly right, Kian. So and that X factor, rest. that X factor they are looking for, I, I, I don't, don't think you'll ever get it I don't believe, And I don't believe it'll come through data either, which is what mm. we're just going to touch on quickly. I mean, it's too in-depth to, to have it. You could talk about this for days, yeah. but we're not going to. Uh, so we're just going to have a quick chat about it now. Um, and, and, and it really is machine learning or algorithm, computer models versus just old school doing the form. And most punters listening to this or watching this love doing the form. Yeah. It's like you and I love doing. We love yeah. doing the form of yeah. trying to solve the puzzle ourselves. We don't want to be told the answer by a computer. Exactly. Uh, whilst we use computers to help us solve a puzzle, we don't want to be told by that computer mm. what the answer is. Like We'd like to work it out ourselves. So from your point of view, and you just touched on it, uh, where do you think your edge is versus, versus your, your machine learning you know, gurus? I think to, I don't have machine learning. So, And again, I said to you earlier, ignorance is bliss for me. I haven't seen an, an algor, algor, algorithm algorithm <laughs> <laughs> algor, algorithm yes S algorithm swept and, and 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 all these numbers and figures and stuff come out and i don't want to and i don't think i ever will i know it holds some weight in terms of ratings and things like that and it's and we we spoke about it earlier with staying races where i probably lack um that sucker punch with working out horses on the best weights and things like that we spoke about that though because when you get to staying races in general, they're horses that have had a lot of starts yes. and there's a lot of data. And that's where I lose my edge because it's, 100%. I'm not finding the up and comer or the horse that moves the best and things like that. It is just horses a lot of time at their mark and, it, and it's it's all to do with fitness and their runs in the race and things like that. So for me, with with that, I'm a very... And, and not everyone else would be the same, but ignorance is bliss for me. It's not something I ever want to delve into um, because I'm happy enough that what I, how I do my form and what I go off my eye and replays and, and, and an old school, pretty vanilla basic approach is, is what's always going to work for me. Yeah, so I think common sense and logic takes you a long, long way yeah. in doing your best. And to, then a lot yeah, of it is luck. In 100%. And I think if you just stick to your simple principles, you use your common sense, you use your logic, you use that human brain and you tap into your strengths and you know where your strengths are. We've touched on most of them during these podcasts. Uh, I know where my strengths are and they're in very similar areas, I think. We, we both like lightly raised horses where there's not a lot of information, there's not a lot of data. And you know those people using those computer models are then losing the edge that they've got and we can really concentrate on the edge that we've got which is our own knowledge our history our background yeah and, and patterns that we've seen time and time and time again in our own minds which repeat themselves time Correct. and time and time again uh and i think that is why your average punter sitting at home betting fairly small but having fun trying to find winners i wouldn't be too put off by the fact that you've got these machine gurus out there that seem to push the market around a bit too when they think they've got it right they'll mm -hmm. move the market because of the amount they can turn over uh, I think we've still got our own little edge, a pocket at least, where we can play and uh, be very competitive. 
Yeah, I'm all for the little man. And I think too, it's about not being influenced too much. When you've got a system that works, it'll it'll work again. Um, and when I say about things you can be influenced about in, in punting, um, that, that would be one of those. If, if you come up with your own set of four tips and then someone says, oh, impossible, this horse cannot win on, on its weights and, and things like that. Once you're starting to get influence, you will lose sight of um, you know what's worked before and, and what usually works. All right, Karen. The last thing we'll say on that is, and this is what I did learn working on all of those models and machine learning um, uh, programs, is that they are only as good as the amount of information that goes into it. So yep. the flip side of that is when you've got races where there's not a lot of information they can access, I think that gives the smaller punter a huge edge. So uh, that's the way I like to look at it. All right, Cam, we're going to get on to the final part of the show, and that is our Black Booker of the Week. Now, you gave us two Black Bookers to follow in Episodes 1 and 2. It's important to note, of course, by the time this gets shown or to air or someone views it, these Black Bookers could well have run either won or lost or, mm. or be well into a campaign, and, and things could change very quickly with horse racing, as we know. So these certainly aren't locked in gold. We're more talking about the process of finding Black yes. Bookers and what we look for in a Black Booker. I think black bookers are very important for punters, especially those recreational punters sitting at home who mightn't have the time to do their own ratings or delve into the form for four or five hours. But what you can do when you're sitting at home is watch a race, see a really good run, and make a note of it, put it into your tab app, whatever, however it works for you best, and make sure you see where that horse turns up next start. And then analyse what sort of race it's in. Is it the sort of race you were hoping they'd turn up in? Mm -hmm. uh, and then if it is have a look at the price and, and assess whether you think it's value or not. So it's an easy thing that any punter can do and, and it just works, you know, or at, le at least it, it it works at times. Obviously, it's never going to work every time, but uh, it's something any punter can do and I think it's just going to improve their punting. Yeah, certainly. Agree? Certainly. So this week, we're just going to go with a horse of Kevin Kemp's, one of our favourite trainers up here who trains from Toowoomba. The horse is called Rubahi. We're going to show you a replay of it and uh, it, it's just a, a really eye-catching run. In fact, her last two starts have been terrific. Things haven't gone right. She's ended up shoved wide on both occasions. She's run on well, touching on what we've covered today. The sectionals are matching what the eye's about to show us in this replay. And the other thing I really like to look for in Black Book Horses is lightly raced horses with upside. And she's only yeah. had six starts. Uh, she's never been far off them. Uh, she's coming back from a listed race. So Kevin's got a lot of options with what he wants to do with her on the back of a listed race for a horse that's only won one start. And... I think she'll get out over some sort of a trip in time as well, at least well beyond 1,200 metres. So there's a black booker for this week that ticks a lot of things that I look for. Mm -hmm. uh, lightly raced, has had a few excuses, probably some disguised runs that aren't going to jump out obvious from the form guide. And uh, let's see how she progresses going forward. With uh, it, It's just jogged me to say something say something as, uh, well, as well in what we're looking for in black bookers because there's many different things and of course I touched on quite a few in episodes one and two another thing I just thought of with your maidens with horses you don't have a lot of data on so it is a lot on the eye and things like that and it does, it's not common but an example um, a million years ago when I took Tora 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 from Dubbo to target that Townsville Cup Rocky Cup Mackay Cup uh, that took a small team and, and one of them was a, a maiden and oh, I think she raced it must have been a class one put her in class one it was the only race we could find that was you know within when she was ready to race and she there was other maidens in that race because it was you know that it was due to lack of racing back then this is a long time ago so there was a few maidens in that race uh, she beat every maiden home in that class one and then ran not disgraced behind the class one horses who had already won a race she went out in a maiden her next start at rocky 51 dollars bolted in it is another thing you can look for horses racing out of their grade and coming back to their grade absolutely good story good mm. point too yeah uh all right cow we're nearly done for this show uh so we might sign off on episode three and just put a teaser out there for episode four because we are going to try the big granddaddy in our final episode of this series at least big bertha we are going to try and <laughs> take punters step by step through framing their own market. Mm -hmm. So get your pens, paper ready. We're going to do our best to make it as easy as possible. It can be done and it's only going to help you going forward if you learn this little skill. Uh, we're also going to touch on bankroll management, something that's super important for anyone, even your recreational punter that's small. Managing bankroll is key, uh, I think, to improving your punting. And of course, we're going to have our usual gear change. We're going to have another Keanism, which everyone loves. And of course, there'll be much, much more. So we'll be back in episode four. You win some, you lose more. For free and confidential support, call the number on the screen or visit the website.